So um, servant leadership is uh, something I'm really passionate about and have been for at least, at least 30 years now. Um, I did my best to learn about it, to apply it, to share ideas with others. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do that tonight. Now, there's a whole lot that can be said about servant leadership. At Pacific Rim Christian University, I teach two 45-hour courses, uh, one undergrad and one graduate course. There's a lot of material. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you highlights of highlights, sort of the cliff notes of the cliff notes, uh, in the hope that that will interest you and give you kind of an overview and idea of what it's all about. I'm going to work from slides, and present material on slides. Then a slide will come up with a question mark in the words comments or questions. Now that will be the opportunity for you to make a comment or ask a question if you want to. Okay, no pressure, right? I mean, just, you know, don't tense up. It's, it's okay if you don't have a comment or a question. But some people are a little shy uh, and they won't, won't ask unless they really get the invitation. Or others might wait until the very end, which it might be hard to remember you know, what we were talking about. So I will stop a number of times for that. Also, during my presentation, I will have a question for you which we'll discuss as a, as a full group, okay? So with that in mind, let me start, start the slides. So the, the three major topics this evening are what is servant leadership? How do we know servant leadership works? Why does servant leadership work so well? All right, those will be the three main headings. So let's jump right in. What is servant leadership? I think there's some important assumptions behind the whole idea of servant leadership. Um, and the biggest one is that most of us love and care about other people. We may not love enough people, we may not love them well enough, but most of us do love and care about others. And when we do care about others, we care about what happens to them, we usually want to help them in some way that's appropriate. We want to be of service. So serving others is a universally recognized fundamental human value can be found in all the world's great religions and the, the writings of many uh, great thinkers. There is a bias here for servant leaders. And the bias is that serving others is not just something that you do. It's what life is about. It's why we're here. It's, it's what we're called to do, who we're called to be. So it's not get up in the morning, get dressed, have breakfast, take the kids to school, go to the office, write a memo, serve others, go to a meeting. You know, it's, it's not one more thing on the list. It's the fundamental idea. It's what life is about. It's about serving, and serving can be a whole lot of little things. I don't know if you've seen this, this clip. I'm going to play a little, this is actually an advertisement created by an insurance company in Thailand. And, and it makes the point extremely well. So here we go.
ที่สวยงามกว่านั้นเป็นอะไรก็ไม่ได้เป็นอะไรก็ไม่ได้เป็นอะไรก็ไม่ได้เป็นอะไรก็ไม่ได้เป็นอะไรก็ไม่ได้เป็นอะไรก็ไม่
He had a test for whether or not a servant leader was doing a good job. He said, the test is, do those serve grow as virtues? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? Really, 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 really focused on growing people. And he knew that it was, he believed it was the fundamental business of every organization, regardless of what kind of organization it was. He knew that when people grow, they benefit, and the capacity of the organization benefits. So when the capacity of the organization grows, it can do things better, or it can do things it was never able to do before. So it's a triple win. The individuals who are growing, they benefit, the organization benefits, and the people being served all benefit, a triple win. And finally, he said, what is the effect on the least privileged in society? We should not be hurting people who are disadvantaged. Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? So that was his definition. And you know, he had a number of characteristics. I'll just mention a few, but the most important, obviously, was the desire to serve. That's where it starts. You don't have a desire to serve, you might end up being a skillful leader, but you wouldn't be a servant leader. Some of the other uh, characteristics he spent some time on in his essay are listening and understanding acceptance and empathy, foresight, awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, <coughs> self-healing, and rebuilding the community. So there are obviously lots and lots and lots of theories or ideas about leadership out there, uh, and tens of thousands of, of new books being published. So scholars uh, compare these different leadership ideas, and my reading of their literature is that scholars think there are four elements that are unique to servant leadership compared with the other theories that the scholars study. And the first is the moral component. Servant leaders really care about treating people right, creating moral dialogue, um, doing the right thing. You would think that's obvious, but there are many leadership theories that do not include any moral or, uh, or ethical element at all. The theories are techniques to get people to do things. You could be Hitler, you could be Gandhi, it doesn't matter, the theory is the theory. Servant leaders aren't like that. They're the moral elements built in. Second, the focus on serving followers for their own good as well as the good of the organization, encouraging their growth so they may reach their fullest potential. There are leadership theories that basically say it's okay to exploit people for the good of the organization. Servant leaders would say no. You don't exploit people, you grow people. It's good for them, it's good for the organization, it's good for those being served. Third, servant leaders are concerned with the success of all stakeholders broadly defined. And this really is the only moral position that an organization can take. If you're having an impact on many different stakeholders, you should care about those impacts. Employees, customers, business partners, shareholders and members, community, society as a whole, including those who are the least privileged. They may even have competing interests, but you need to be aware you need to take those into account. And finally, self-reflection is a counter to the leader's hubris. Um, leaders, servant leaders know that it's not about them. It's about meeting the needs of others. They have an important role to play, but it's not about them. So the leader tends to be more humble. So those are four things that, that I've drawn from the literature that are different about servant leadership. So what was Greenleaf after? Well, he really wanted to make the world a better place. His, his idea was servant leaders would help their organizations to become servant institutions to truly serve people. They would focus on serving their employees, customers, business, partners, communities, and society as a whole. And the result would be the quality of our lives would improve, the world would become a better place for everyone. So he was after social change. Servant leaders were going to transform institutions into servant institutions. There are a lot of misconceptions about servant leadership. I'll just touch on a couple. Um, one is that somehow servant leadership is soft. Um, I have not met a servant leader who is soft. Uh, servant leaders can make hard decisions whenever necessary in order to serve others, for example. Uh, if, if somebody is really behaving badly, they can discipline people. If somebody is really not the right fit for the organization, they can help them either become the right fit or find, find work somewhere else. Another issue is, is the use of power. Servant leaders can exercise power, but it's not what they seek. It's not what they seek. And when they do exercise power, they exercise it with others, not over others. And they exercise it on behalf of others, not for their own personal benefit. Again, it's not about that. I don't think servant leadership is a style of leading. And one reason I don't like that is styles of leading are about the leader. The servant leadership is not about the leader. It's about those that need to be served. So it's not a single style of leading. It's whatever style is needed in each situation, which can be different. 
So if the ship is sinking, the captain can serve others best by ordering people to the lifeboats. That's authoritative or authoritarian. Um, but if the servant leader is working with volunteers who can just get up and go home and say they don't want to do it anymore, uh, then listening and advising would be the best way to serve. Very different style because of a different situation and a different need. Servant leaders are also situational when it comes to how they work with the people around them. Um, this is an interesting dilemma because we like to think we're going to treat everybody equally. But everybody is not the same. So if you treat everybody the same way, it's going to be good for some people, not good for other people. So servant leaders uh, tend to be situational. They know that some people need more direction, some need less. Some need more encouragement, some need less. Some need more coaching, some need less. Some need more freedom, some need less. So they link up with people where they are in their own developmental cycle and work with them and move them forward from that point. Finally, this is about getting the work done. This is about getting results. It's a better way to get results. And I think servant leaders get two results, not just one. Um, every leader in every organization uh, has to obtain the resources to continue and, if possible, expand the work of the organization. So they need a profit or a surplus, and that is an organizational need that has to be addressed. But servant leaders have one more kind of result, an additional one. They serve their colleagues and customers, and they make the world a better place. And that is the organization's purpose. We don't want to confuse the need with the purpose. And here's the first slide with the question mark, comments or questions. So I've just run through a real quick set of ideas that define servant leadership. Anybody have a comment or a question? I love it. You love it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I didn't make it up. I'm just sharing with you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Linda. When you have What do you do when you have very diverse points of view, values, cultures? Um, it's difficult, um, but you listen. Um, and you, you use the service model, the power model. You, there, keep look at to some of those those skills. Servant leadership doesn't solve every problem. It's a different way to approach problems. It makes it more likely that you can solve a problem because it's not about my power. It's about the need. It's about you know how we can possibly work together. Um, there are some issues that are pretty intractable, uh, but certainly there's just a better way to approach them. We'll talk a little more about that. Thank you for the question. Anybody else? Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Um, how do we know that servant leadership works? Well, we've got lots of anecdotal evidence, people telling their stories about their own experience. But about 12 years ago, leadership scholars began to conduct empirically rigorous studies of servant leadership in the workplace. I mean, scholars spent a huge, like decades, working on transformational leadership and then leader member exchange and uh, began shifting into servant leadership, coming up with certain definitions and standards. And the results so far have been very positive. I'm just going to run through very quickly uh, summaries of the research that I'm aware of. Servant leaders facilitate effective teamwork. That's really important. Servant leadership may enhance both job performance and commitment to the organization. Very important. Servant leaders may inspire followers to serve the community in which the organization is embedded. Empirical research has revealed that employees of servant leaders are more helping and creative than those working with leaders who score lower on servant leadership. Uh, one of the aspects of this is servant leaders create a fair workplace. And when people feel they're being treated fairly, they give back. They go beyond. They pitch in and they help out. Uh, and I like that creative part, too. That's a competitive advantage. Servant leadership's been shown to be positively related to employee job satisfaction. You get good employees, you want to keep them, you want them to be satisfied. It's a good thing. I'm aware of one study about the impact of servant leadership on the performance of the entire organization. The other studies would be units within the organization. This would be the entire organization. Um, Peterson led a group of her colleagues into Silicon Valley, um, and they interviewed 126 CEOs of technology companies, spent hours interviewing them, and after interviewing them, they categorized them into three categories. They were founder, founder of the company, or a narcissist, imagine finding any of those in Silicon Valley, <laughs> and servant leader. So they had the three categories, they placed them in those categories after extensive interviews, and then they studied the financial performance of each company, found that the best performing companies were led by servant leaders. 
second came founders, the worst was the narcissists. Um, so they found a positive relationship between servant leadership and firm performance. Here's a quote, CEOs may potentially improve their firm's performance through more inclusive forms of leadership, such as servant leadership, that take into account a broader number of stakeholders and that are more other focused. Doesn't surprise me that servant leadership principles are being implemented in every sector, public, private, academic, military, nonprofit. I've actually worked in public, private, academic, and nonprofit sectors. I've seen servant leadership work. People um, often suspect that it doesn't work well in business. I mean, you know, business, hard, hard nosed, competitive world. Um, actually, uh, we know quite a few businesses that, that use servant leadership. Remember, Greenleaf came from a business. Companies that have implemented servant leadership principles include many that have been on the Fortune Magazine list of the 100 best companies to work for in America, such as Starbucks, Southwest Airlines, TV Industries, the Container Store, Aflac, and Sonovas Financial, just as examples. If you're interested in the research side, um, I'd like to recommend Dr. Bob Leiden, Professor of Management at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he's a wonderful human being. He's a leading researcher and scholar on servant leadership. Every couple of years, he provides me with a list of the highlights of scientific research on servant leadership. These are the studies that he considers to be highly reliable because the methodology is good. And I put them up on my website, to servefirst.com, where you can also find an annotated list of servant leadership books and essays and articles and so forth um, to serve first. So the research says it, it works. Anecdotal evidence is that it works. So let's move to the question, why does servant leadership work so well? You know, it's almost embarrassing because on one level, it's just so simple. Servant leaders identify and meet the needs of others. That is not a complicated idea. They identify and meet the needs of their colleagues so they can perform at their highest levels. They identify and meet the needs of their customers, I mean customer, client, patient, member, student, citizen, whoever is being served so that they will be truly served. And this works. This works really well. People perform at their highest levels, customers are happy. Behind that, I think we can, we can talk about a number of other supporting concepts. Uh, servant leaders live the service model of leadership, not the power model. Uh, they're focused on theory Y assumptions, not theory X. We'll talk about that. Uh, they get beyond extrinsic motivation and emphasize intrinsic motivation. They focus on meaning at work, uh, and they are meaning makers for others, and they use uh, effective key practices of leadership. So let's talk a little bit about the service model of leadership. I just sort of made this up. This is how I see the world. Uh, I think there are two major models or ideas about leadership. One I call the power model of leadership, and the other the service model of leadership. And they're very different. The power model of leadership is about acquiring and building personal power, which is usually about using people for your own personal benefit. The service model of leadership is about making a difference in the lives of others, which is about serving people. Welcome. Are you doing okay? Thank you for coming. Brought the average age of the room right down. Okay, there we go. So the power model versus the service model. Hi, <laughs> How are you? <laughs> so what are the characteristics of the service model? Well, it arises out of a love for others and the leader's desire to serve people. It assumes the leader does not know it all. The leader consults with others and works with teams. The focus is not on the leader. The focus is on identifying and meeting the needs of others. And power is only a tool. It's a means and not an end. The leader, advantages for the leader, the leader is not isolated, but is first among equals on a team. So leadership is shared. This reduces the hazards and burdens of the individual leader. There are hazards in placing too much uh, on the shoulders of one person, but it's also a burden. There are a lot of jobs now that really cannot be done by one person. It's just too much. The leader is relevant and more successful because the leader is identifying and meeting real needs. The leader finds meaning in helping individuals and organizations to grow. Remember, 
the measure of the servant leader, do those grow as persons? Organizational advantages, individuals grow in their capacity to serve, they perform at their highest levels. Teams are more effective, we saw the research on that. There's more commitment, creativity, and voluntary pitching in. There's greater job satisfaction, these are all good things for organizations. And the advantages for society, servant-led institutions are effective because they're addressing real needs. One of the sad problems with the power model is that so many people in the power model are not trying to help anybody. They're not trying to make anything better, they're just trying to, to gain power for themselves. Servant-led institutions really address needs. They respect all stakeholders, try to make a difference in the lives of those they serve, promote a more just, caring, productive, sustainable society. So, Servant leaders live the service model of leadership, and this is one of the reasons that servant leadership works so well. It results in higher performance for individuals, promotes the greater good for society at large. And there's another one of those slides. Comments or questions? It sounds more like a family. Okay, that's good. Sounds more like, sounds like a good family. A supportive yeah. good family, not a dysfunctional family. Not a dysfunctional family, family. okay. <laughs> Okay, good. And you're in a safe environment. A safe environment, yeah. Okay, good. Comments or questions? Yeah, Nick. I'm trying to follow a question. It has to do with the companies that are, uh, you know, profit goal oriented to you know, sell a product, serve the community, right. but also make a profit. Right. And um, sometimes not everybody sees the, the goal the way maybe the leader would. And so you go to the different departments, you go to different people. Maybe there's not complete agreement. Right. What are you doing um, that? That's a that's a good point. So um, there may be people within the same organization who are in the power model, and some may be in the servant model. Depends on where they are. Um, and I think usually the way to try to bring that together is by focus on what you do, and that pitches us toward the key practices that we'll talk about at the end. But if you focus on on actual thing, like how well are we listening to our customers? How well are we developing our people? You try to build a sense of community and unity around key practices without having to solve the problem of are you really in the power model or are you really in the service model? So that's a, that's a strategy for trying to work into uh, some kind of unity. I'd just like to follow up with the, uh, the idea that the conflict itself, where there is some tension, uh, there might actually be some passion behind right. that tension. It's not necessarily a bad thing, yeah. Conflict can be productive if it's about ideas and not people attacking each other personally. Yeah, okay. You both, yeah, Andrew. I was just thinking, um, <clears throat> one of the key things I find missing in uh, the, the way I observe people at work is that they're not finding enough meaning right. in what they're doing. And I think exactly. that's a great key to improving the situation is to see how we can enhance the meaning of jobs. Yes. We'll be talking about that. I want everybody to know I did not ask Andrew to raise that. But, um, no, I, I agree completely. So we'll spend, spend some time on that. Yeah, that's coming up. Yeah, later. One question I have is uh, how do you reconcile uh, a power leader, someone who's a power leader versus a servant leader? Mm -hmm. And how does, that, how does a servant leader work in conjunction with, or at least in you know, a way in which they can right. dialogue with? Because he's a narcissist, a power leader. It's, um, so, how would a servant leader work with a power leader? Yes. Uh, it's a great question, um, and I can, only, I can give you my best answer, which may, may not be good enough. Um, basically, um, when people are in that situation, I do not recommend that they march into the power leader's office with a banner that says servant leadership is the answer. Um, I'm, here to, I'm here to save the organization. Sit down, sit down and listen to me. Um, people in the power model like the power model. If it's working for them, they think that's the right model and, and you know, they work hard. You know, they, they clambered their way to the top um, by whatever means. And so, so you don't talk about servant leadership. But going back to, to, to the next point, you start talking about things that you do. In fact, you might just do those things. If you're in a branch or a unit or a division, you might just do a better job of listening and developing your colleagues and you know all the things that servant leaders do. In which case, I think they'll either leave you alone because it's working, or they'll come by and say, hmm, that seems to be working. What are you doing? And you still don't give the sermon on servant leadership. You just talk about 
you know, we're really doing these these particular practices and, and we're really happy about the results we're getting. I think it's very hard to change the mind of somebody, uh, especially if they're later in their career and they've climbed their way to the top and they're hanging on to their power for dear life. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to change their mind about the way the world should be. So, yeah, you do the things servant leaders do. That you can create a, you can create a, a, a world of authenticity right. for yourself, and maybe that will grow. Right. Yes, please. Hi. So, happy hour with you is this question and your answer. So, a power leader and a servant leader can work together. If the servant leader, your true servant leader, you're going in there not with the expectation to change right. the power leader, but to understand the power leader. Right. So when you understand, you can then facilitate and have a better relationship. Um, but as a servant leader, your goal is just to make all people that, to include your power. Right. That's good. So the servant leader doesn't want to change the power leader, right. but to understand, connect, link up. In order to help facilitate that relationship. Right, right. Good. Very good. And lots of prayer. Prayer helps. <laughs> yeah. Several times a day. Okay. Yes. 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 Um, for Starbucks, so um, Howard B. Hart, there's two Howards that got Starbucks going. There's Schultz and there's Bihar. Um, actually, there are, there are three of them. It's, they have like 28 stores and they built it over 20 years to whatever it is, 15,000 or more stores. Howard Bihar uh, was an advocate of servant leadership. So he shared Greenleaf's essay, the one I referred to, he shared that with new employees. Um, and he tried to do a number of things. Uh, he tried uh, to focus on listening. Um, and he also focused on taking care of employees. So one of the most amazing things Starbucks did was to provide healthcare benefits to part-timers, which was pretty much unheard of in the, in, you know, in the American economy because it's expensive. But they made that kind of commitment to, to their employees. So uh, that's how he tried to, to, to implement it. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, keep moving because I know you really would like to hear about theory X and Y. Anybody know about anybody know about theory X and Y? <laughs> okay. Don't tell. Okay. So let me introduce you to Douglas McGregor, who lived from 1906 to 1964. He was a professor of management at MIT. He published a really really important book, The Human Side of Enterprise, a classic, well worth reading today published in 1960, still worth reading because we haven't learned enough from it yet. He said our assumptions about people affect how we try to lead them. And he coined theory X and theory Y uh, as summaries about the assumptions that we have about people in the workplace. So theory X, these are the assumptions in theory X. Most people dislike work. They will avoid it if they can. Because they don't like work, most people must be coerced, controlled, or threatened with punishment to get them to work toward the achievement of organizational objectives. Some of you are already thinking of specific individuals. That's not, that's not nice. Okay. Most people want to be directed and want to avoid responsibility. They have little ambition. They just want to be secure. It's a really negative attitude toward people. Now, I can imagine this growing up during the 19th century, during the Industrial Revolution, when people had factory work. Really repetitive, boring work they didn't really want to do. Theory Y is pretty much the opposite. Uh, this grew up during the humanist movement in the 1950s and 60s in the United States. So the assumptions here are the work is as natural as play or rest. The threat of punishment is not the only way to get people to work. People will exercise self-direction, self-control, and working toward organizational objectives when they're committed to them. And committed to those objectives is a function of the rewards associated with their achievement. Not necessarily material rewards. Could be psychological, could be meaning, could be longing, being included, and so on. Most people learn not only to accept, but to seek responsibility. A lot of people have the capacity to exercise a relatively high degree of imagination, ingenuity, and creativity in solving organizational problems. So a very positive, respectful attitude toward, toward people. But what McGregor said was under the conditions of modern industrial life, the intellectual potential of most people is only partially utilized. And the reason is that Theory X managers hold them back. 
So McGregor said that theory X managers think employees are lazy, indifferent, unwilling to take responsibility, uncreative, and uncooperative. As a result, managers don't let employees contribute their best work, and then blame employees for not contributing their best. They say that poor performance is the employee's fault. Theory Y managers think that employees have a lot of potential. So if employees are not contributing their best work, it is management's fault. Managers need to help employees contribute and realize their full potential. That's management's job. It's very, very different actions following on very different assumptions. Servant leadership works so well because servant leaders have theory why assumptions about people at work. They respect their colleagues, they believe in their potential, and they seek to draw out their best. And they do. Here's another question mark. Theory X and theory Y. I yes. Okay, Dr. Keith. So, according to many analysts out there that have studied the job market, uh, they have been saying that there is a shortage of actual qualified or potential uh, great employees. So, do you think that theory X is losing to theory Y? Or vice versa? Um, I don't know. If, if it's a shortage of good employees because there are not enough human beings, that's one thing. If it's a shortage because we don't believe they have ability or skill, that's another thing. And um, uh, a servant leader would say, if they're willing to work, if they're willing to learn, if they're willing to grow, then we will help them grow so they can perform. They can fill the niche, they can, they can do the work that needs to be done. Um, it's it's um, there's strange things going on in human resources. I'm not, I'm not an expert, um, but um, there are some people who believe that you only hire people who are already qualified, and if you can't find them, you can't find them. And there are people who believe, well, hire the best people you can find and train them, grow them. And I think certainly there would be more on the grow side of that. Which one do you think is growing out there more? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what's what's growing more. Um, do you have do you have an inkling? I do. I, uh, I think that I suspect it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I do. Unfortunately, I think that uh, uh, the education system in the United States has uh, declined within the past twenty years. I see. Okay. And there is not an effort to uh, cultivate theory one. I see. Uh, okay. And, and managers are having trouble actually finding theory why employees that are able to perform and, and, and many analysts, prominent analysts, are, are kind of in a crisis mode. Right. That's why, uh, not getting into politics or anything like that, uh, many are in, in using immigrants from India for technology right. or from Asian countries for math and science. So I think that there is a crisis and that uh, right. theory X is kind of like being kind of like the mode that is being promoted or is being spread. Right, if you expect people to already be qualified before you hire them versus, you know, hire for attitude, train for skills. You know, so the servant leader is more likely to hire for personal qualities, character, basic ability, and then train them to do the job. So, yeah. I have another comment. And it has to do with the, 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 the profits for now, the quota for now. So the employee might have a, a good idea. Yes. And, but the response from management might be, hey, why don't you just take a chill? That's what we've been doing for all these years. We've been working, that's why we're still here. So, um, Nick, I think, I'm, I'm so passionate about servant leadership. It was decades before I was willing to admit there was any downside at all to servant leadership. Um, there's one challenge, which is it's not a quick fix. You've got to invest in people. I mean, growing people takes time, listening, growing, all of that. You invest and you don't get an immediate result, but the result you eventually get is terrific. Um, so the, the organizations that I know of that are really having trouble thinking about certain leadership are big corporations that have got to report their earnings every quarter uh, that affects their stock price. It's hard for them to look beyond the quarter to the idea that they're really going to develop people. On the other end, I, I've worked with some family corporations, but they're not just thinking beyond the quarter, they're thinking of the next two or three generations. And they are really investing and really using certain leadership uh, approaches. So yeah, I think, I think you made a good point. I'm going to keep going. 
because uh, Andrew pointed out the importance of uh, the meaning. Meaning, motivation, and productivity. So there's two kinds of, of um, motivation that we're, we're used to, to hearing about. Um, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic is about what you have to do, not what you want to do. So the task uh, is not seen as fun or interesting or fulfilling or meaningful. That's probably boring. And so managers have to offer incentives or threats of punishment to get the task done. And we have this awful image of the carrot and the stick with donkeys, right? You dangle the carrot in front of the donkey so he'll move forward to try to get the carrot. And if he doesn't do that, you whack him on the backside with a stick to get him moving. Not a nice image for treating human beings. Not really nice for donkeys either. But the basic idea is if you do this, you'll get that. You do this, you'll get some kind of reward or you'll avoid punishment. Intrinsic motivation is the opposite. It's, it's about what you want to do, not what you have to do. So people are intrinsically motivated when they do something that it is fun, it is interesting, it is fulfilling, it is meaningful. And when you're intrinsically motivated, the work itself is your reward. So we don't say if you do this, you'll get that. We say if you do this, well, you'll like it. Well, that'd be interesting. That'd be meaningful. Big difference. So here's the part of the evening where I ask you some questions. What motivates you? Are you intrinsically or extrinsically motivated? Or both? What extrinsic rewards are most attractive to you and what intrinsic rewards are most attractive to you? What do you think? Anybody? Are you intrinsic or extrinsic? Intrinsic. Okay, tell me why. I've always enjoyed helping people and doing things that make a difference. Okay. I get a personal reward. It's not like I got a million dollars or anything. Okay. I felt very satisfied. I felt very satisfied in most of my career and I've worked more than 40 years. Okay. And I'll be working until about 10 years after my okay. eventual cremation. Okay. So, <laughs> it's rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, that's intrinsic. <laughs> Who else? Intrinsic or extrinsic or both? You like tea. You do like tea. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, the food down the hall, right? Yeah. So you're referring to extrinsic? I think it's a combination of both. Okay. You, you surely need to uh, fend for your family. Okay. And, and then at the same time, it's always nice to have uh, uh, people appreciate your, your, your good or service that you have to contribute to the community. Okay. But, you know, it's nice to be able to make a dime. Okay, so there's some extrinsic motivation, make some money, take care of your family. Okay, anybody else? Intrinsic, extrinsic, or both? Yeah. I would say it's both as well. Both. Uh, when I first came to America, I remember an elementary school teacher, and uh, she used to give stars, golden stars, and put it on my papers and some things like that. And I realized, God, I really wanted that. Mm -hmm. single time. Really one of the stars. And it gave me affirmation mm -hmm. that I was getting something. Mm -hmm. It was very, very clear. As I got older, I became more intrinsic, but mm -hmm. that part was very important. And I, I kept I keep thinking about that in relationship to my Japanese students. Mm -hmm. I need to incorporate more extreme extrinsic rewards. Hmm. Uh, to a certain extent, because there has to be some sense of transition. It cannot be something in which I can just immediately have them understand the concepts of critical thinking or okay. of intrinsic. So you're looking at kind of the life cycle part of this, right. or you may need extrinsic at the beginning and it may then right. become more intrinsic later on. Right. Okay? And I'm um, not referring to you, but I know people who still have the stars that they were given in elementary school. <laughs> no, that, that, that's your point. They're important and they have them in a drawer somewhere. Um, they look back and they feel good about it. They remember that. A anybody else? Yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking when you talked about immigrants, um, one of the things that happens is motivation. So if you come from a place where there are no opportunities or there's corruption right. or coercion or you know, a government that is just going to not have any possibility of anything, Intrinsic um, when they come to the United States, or you know, then that's the great American dream. Yep. So, I'm, I'm curious because some it seems to me that the extrinsic may be holding people down, mm -hmm. and that's the, 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 the definition of bad leadership or bad context. And then the intrinsic one says, a mm -hmm. lot of okay, takes off. Okay, anybody else? 
Yeah. Oh. I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Both. Both. Because you have to Intrinsic, you're not going to be happy, you may not be sustainable, you may not do your best. Yeah, I don't think it's going to affect how you uh, do your work. Yeah, okay. You might not realize it, but it's. So, so some of you have come to the same conclusion as um, Frederick Kurtzberg, um, who wrote one of the most read articles in the history of the Harvard Business Review. It was published back in 1968. 20 years later, they sold 300,000 more copies than any other article ever published in the Harvard Business Review. It was called, One More Time, How Do You Motivate Employees? He argued that some factors are hygiene factors, which are really extrinsic, and others are intrinsic factors. So he said the hygiene factors are extrinsic ones. Our company, it's really everything that surrounds a person uh, in their life and work, company policy and administration, supervision, relationship with a supervisor, Work conditions, salary, relationships with peers, personal life, relationships with subordinates, status, security, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He said these factors are the primary cause of extreme dissatisfaction on the job. Employees, employers need to get these right so that employees will not be dissatisfied. So these are important. It's not saying they're not important. They are important because if you don't get these right, people are going to be dissatisfied. Um, but extreme satisfaction comes from intrinsic motivators. Achievement, recognition, the work itself, responsibility, advancement, growth. The hygiene factors and intrinsic motivators are not the opposite of each other. They represent different needs. We need both. But more and better hygiene factors will not produce extreme satisfaction. Only intrinsic motivators will do that. So as Russell just said, the happiness, the meaning, all that comes on the intrinsic side. And basically what, what he's arguing is that you've got to get the extrinsic correct, but people are not going to lift off and do their best unless the intrinsic uh, motivation is available. So it turns out that meaning is an intrinsic motivator. Well, my wife and I had a chance to meet Dr. Kenneth W. Thomas uh, years ago. He and his colleagues spent 16 years studying uh, intrinsic motivation at work, and he identified four intrinsic rewards. A sense of choice, which means you know, have some choice as to how you do your work. A sense of confidence. So it may be difficult, it may be a challenge, but you know you can do it. A sense of accomplishment. Yeah, we are getting something done, we're making some progress. And a sense of meaning. He said a sense of meaningfulness is the opportunity you feel to pursue a worthy task purpose. That you're on a valuable mission. That your purpose matters in the larger scheme of things. This was important to, to Greenlee. Uh, he had uh, what he called his business ethic, which is the work exists for the person as much as the person exists for the work. And this is pretty radical, actually. Put another way, the business exists as much to provide meaningful work to the person as it exists to provide a product or service to the customer. So, Common sense tells us if you find meaning in your work, so you're intrinsically motivated, you're probably going to be able to do more and do it better and do it longer, uh, helping more people, improving or saving more lives. It is really, really nice when uh, a scholar comes along and supports common sense. And Dr. Adam Grant has, has done that. Um, Adam Grant's kind of a, a star. He's a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So, I just got a really good book called Give and Take. Uh, I recommend it highly. But in one of his research projects, he separated what he called pro-social motivation and intrinsic motivation to study their effects, if any, on each other. So pro-social motivation, he said, is the desire to benefit or help others to serve a greater purpose. So he's trying to really zero in on that. Uh, he went into the workplace. He studied workers at a telephone call center and employees at a fire station. And what he was really interested in was persistence, performance and productivity. 
which are all important. He concluded that employees display higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity when they experience pro-social and intrinsic motivations in tandem, together. So here's the chart. Pro-social motivation, the desire to serve, to benefit or help others, to serve a greater purpose, plus the intrinsic motivation, because you're growing, you're doing meaningful work, results in higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity. This is, this is very tangible bottom line stuff. Um, and it really supports Greenleaf's definition. Um, it starts with a desire to serve. That's what Greenleaf said. Servant leadership starts with a desire to serve, to benefit others. That's the pro-social motivation. And he emphasized growing, growing people, the way you measure uh, servant leaders' performance. And he emphasized meaning, that the work should exist for the person as much as the person exists for the work. So Adam Grant's research supports the idea that servant leadership results in higher levels of persistence, performance, and productivity. Um, this is a really, really nice uh, conclusion. Comments uh, or questions? Yes, please. I was wondering about the distraction of the phone people checking for messages and stuff. It seems like that's almost all consuming now more than caring You know, I, I can't get employees to stop checking all the time. Right. Texting, you know. Right. So. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know whether that was part of Adam Grant's study at all. I mean, no, I know I it's a real issue it's in the workplace. It's, just how do we get it? oh, it's, a, it's a big issue. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it just depends on what the work is and what the workplace is and what the rules are. I mean, some people you got to deposit your phone at the door before you go into the meeting. Other places you do the phone. Your phone is, is part of your work. You had a question. I'm glad that comment came up. I don't think that technology uh, or the manner in which you communicate is mutually exclusive from servant leadership. And I believe that if you're really committed to being a servant leader, you'll lean into that and learn how to communicate with your employees. So if you separate yourself and keep yourself sort of on a pedestal and say that you don't engage in those sort of platforms, you're really leaning more towards a power dynamic. And you have to learn to be sensitive to how people are thinking. So if you're not existing on the platform, then their conversations are not going to include you. And it's going to feel like, why are my subordinates not respecting me? Right. Sort of thing. But it's also, it depends on the nature of your business, like when you do and don't use those platforms to communicate. But servant leadership, when you have a common or egalitarian leadership model, it is better to get comments and solicit things in real time through social media, texting, and other platforms. So I would caution against the blanket statements that are being made about texting is bad, phones are bad, and it's important to evolve with technology so that you're not putting yourself on a pedestal that you should be And yet, and so I'll make a blanket statement. Um, <laughs> that I'm in a workplace that has several generations, <coughs> so we don't all use the same technology. And that, that adds to the challenge. And that, so I think the challenge for the servant leader is to make sure there are many different ways to listen. So that you're listening in the way that people want to speak. Face to face, in the hallway, you know, through, through text or, or you know, social media. Um, some of us use email. And I, I like email. Um, and, um, not everybody at my university uses it. I'm really fond of it because uh, I get to type out responses in a uh, full, full uh, keyboard, and I get to file things in folders. And, but I think it's a challenge. It's even harder now to listen in so many different ways to make sure you're getting you're the getting message. Um, is it, Nick, you? Nick, <laughs> okay, okay, all right, go ahead. Well, I just remember reading about uh, the importance of the leader uh, you know, casting the vision for the organization. And you know, and essentially, you know, the organization itself is, is led by the leader, and and you surely want uh, you know, employees or, or volunteers, whatever it might be, to, to buy into the, the vision. Is, 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 is it a, a, a cooperative uh, creating a vision, or is there a vision that's coming kind of coming from leadership? No, I, I think certain leaders develop the vision with others. Yep. Um, you know, I, I tried this idea of 
you know, jumping on the horse and galloping off, blowing the trumpet, only to turn around and find nobody following me. Um, that was not a good experience. No, I, I don't think. I don't think it. See, it's not just making the decision; it's implementing the decision. I think servant leaders are really good at making decisions in a way that people understand the decision and are ready to implement it. And possible obstacles to implementation have already been identified and perhaps taken care of. So I really believe it's got to be got to be a larger group process. And so the role of the leader then is to lead that process and then to announce the result, which people should recognize because they were involved in it. Even if they don't agree with what it is, they will recognize how it came to be and they'll understand. That's good. Lucas. Uh, what have been your intrinsic motivators? And if they have changed, how and why? So it's getting real personal all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. so, um, <laughs> so let's see, I might tell you, give you an answer, and then after you can ask my wife, what is, is that right? Make uh, a general statement. Yeah, general statement. Now, I have been, I've been very, very interested in meaning since I wrote the paradox of man at age 19. Um, I have really focused on doing things that I thought were meaningful meaningful to me because I thought I was able to use whatever gifts I might have, you know, in that particular work or process and meaningful in terms of the positive impacts that might have on others. I think that's kind of been the driving theme, which has not resulted in a traditional career, but has resulted in a series of, of jobs that I found really meaningful. And I, I'm, and I feel really grateful uh, to have happened. I'm getting a little close to home now, getting some personal questions. I think it would be time to move on to uh, a little bit more on meaning, though. Stay with meaning. Let's look a little more closely at meaning at work. Because I think that a huge amount of meaning is available to everybody. Um, when we go to work each day, we help people to get what they need. I mean, that's what our organizations do. We help people get food, clothing, shelter, education, workspace, equipment, information, records, health care, health insurance. We help people get things they need. By the way, I believe every, every organization exists to meet needs. They're not meeting needs, they shouldn't exist. So, by definition, um, organizations are having an impact. When we help people get what they need, we make a difference in their lives. Right? We may improve the quality of their lives, we may even save their lives. That should give us a, a lot of meaning at work. So, we don't just get income by going to work. We also get meaning. And we need both of those things. So, I say we get we can get what we need by helping others get what they need. We need the meaning and, and the income. We get the meaning from helping others. Here's a uh, really strong quote from an article that Catherine Bailey and Adrian Madden published in the uh, MIT Sloan Management Review a few years ago. What makes work meaningful or meaningless? Here's the quote. Researchers have shown meaningfulness to be more important to employees than any other aspect of work including pay and rewards, opportunities for promotion, or working conditions. That's, that's an amazing finding. More important to employees than any other aspect of work. Meaningful work can be highly motivational, leading to improved performance, commitment, and satisfaction. So that's why servant leaders do whatever they can to create an environment in which people can find meaning and try to enhance the meaning for their colleagues. And so, of course, they, they're good at finding meaning for themselves, but they, they're good at finding meaning in the work of others and share that meaning with them. Uh, and that may mean redesigning work so that it is more meaningful. And often that means redesigning it so that you are more in touch with the people who are benefiting from your work. So it becomes real. Uh, you see the impact that it has on others. I'll tell you just a little story about that. Um, years ago, I worked um, at the YMCA in Honolulu. Um, and I was, was a bunch of us staff people, the Metropolitan Office over there at the new one and why. And so I'd be busy at my desk, um, writing and, and so forth. And Don Anderson, who was the president, every once in a while he'd come, he'd knock on the door and he'd say, let's go see the kids. And so we'd go downstairs and we'd watch children laughing and playing games and swimming and reading and learning new skills. And we would remember why we worked at the YMCA. And we'd go back upstairs to be motivated. For a while, our kids were in programs at the New Honor Y, and when we went down to look at the kids, they saw me, and they were shocked. This is where you go when you leave in the morning? You go to work? But I think seeing the impact is so important. And so often the redesigning of work is to connect people better with the impact. 
In experiencing work as meaningful, we cease to be workers or employees and relate as human beings, reaching out in a bond of common humanity to others. For organizations seeking to manage meaningfulness, the ethical and moral responsibility is great since they are bridging the gap between work and personal life. We, we try to compartmentalize or segment our lives. We're really not that good at it. Uh, we, we bring our whole selves to work. Um, we should try to bridge work and personal life. Um, had the opportunity to um, spend a little time with Cheryl Batchelder when she was the head of Popeyes. I was so grateful. Um, my wife and I lived and worked in Singapore for, for three years. And Popeyes was producing the only chicken that I could eat. It was real chicken breast. Some of these other guys were selling chicken parts that I wasn't familiar with. And so I was so grateful that we could buy real chicken at Popeyes in Singapore. Anyway, it turns out that, that Cheryl has really focused on the idea of purpose and meaning as a way of lifting her colleagues uh, when she was uh, the head of uh, Popeyes Louisiana Kitchen from 2007 to 2017. At the time, they had 2.4 billion in annual sales, they had 2,100 restaurants, they were in 27 countries. And she was on the board, and, and the sales and profits had been declining for six years when the board asked her, would you step in and become the CEO? Six years after she became the CEO, sales had climbed 25%, the market share had grown from 14 to 21%, profitability was up by 40%, and the stock price was up 450%, quite a record. One of the most important things she did was to invite the company's leaders to develop a personal purpose that gave meaning to their work. She really focused on that. She said it's the leader's responsibility to bring purpose and meaning to the work of the organization. So they conducted workshops. They took team members through several exercises regarding their life experiences, their values, their strengths, and their action plans. She said at Popeye's, leaders who have an action plan for their personal purpose are having more impact on the business. Personal purpose leads to sustained superior performance. Because servant leaders look closely to their most important sources of meaning, they are motivated and energized and can sustain their leadership over time. Another reason that servant leadership works. And by the way, I know there are people who talk about servant leadership as though it's some terrible stoic duty, you have to force yourself out of bed in the morning, oh God, I gotta get up and help people today. Um, those aren't the servant leaders that I know. It's not like that at all. They're leading joyful lives. Servant leadership is not about self-denial or self-sacrifice. It is about self-fulfillment. Comments or questions? Well, we're not done, so I can, you want me to keep going? Okay. Key practices are our last section. So, servant leadership starts with being, it starts with character, it starts with the love and the desire to serve and the servant's heart. Um, but there are specific things that servant leaders do. And um, I wrote a book a number of years ago called The Case for Servant Leadership. Uh, we have copies over here, they're free. Um, I brought about 30 of them tonight, so um, this should be enough for most of you. And one chapter of the book is about key practices. Now, in interest of full disclosure, I did not spend years of research narrowing down all kinds of key practices to the number seven. Uh, it was two weekends. Um, I just wanted to show that there are things servant leaders actually do. It's not just about being, it's also about doing. And I thought these, from my own experience and from, from the research, were important. Self-awareness, listening, changing the pyramid, developing your colleagues. Coaching, not controlling, unleashing the energy and intelligence of others, and foresight. So when we had the question earlier about what do you do, you know, you people in the power model and you're in the service model, these are the kinds of things that servant leaders do that help them to be effective. Tonight, I'd just like to focus a little bit on listening, because Robert Brindley felt that listening is the premier skill of a servant leader. He said that only a true natural servant automatically responds to any problem by listening first. So you don't start with your own knowledge or expertise, your own programs or, or procedures or facilities. You start by asking people. You know, basically, you're asking what are your wants, what are your needs, what are your hopes, what are your dreams, how can I help? 
And by the way, if the servant leader who's asking cannot help, the servant leader will find somebody who can help so that the, the need can still be met. So this thing is how servant leaders identify the needs of colleagues and customers so they can address those needs. It's how they link up and are able to solve problems and seize opportunities. If you're good at identifying the need, you're in a great position to meet the need. I mean, it's that, that simple. Um, this is one of the reasons that servant leadership works so well in the free enterprise system. You really listen to, to customers or prospective customers and figure out what they really need. Then you don't have to ram it down their throats and spend a lot of money on marketing. You've got something they need and they'll come and buy it and it'll work. Save a lot of time and money. Now, I'm thinking of listening in the real broad sense. So it be observation, it be face-to-face -face conversations, interviews with colleagues and customer surveys, suggestion boxes, discussion groups, focus groups, market research, community needs assessments. Everything you can do to find out about people, what their needs are, so you know uh, how to address them. One of the people that I uh, had the pleasure of spending a couple days with in Singapore was Dr. Ernesto Ceroli, uh, very animated, wonderful uh, Italian. We brought him into the, uh, I worked for the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership in the U.S. and then in Singapore. We brought him in to Singapore. Um, Dr. Ceroli, uh, his team has worked with 300 communities and they've helped create 40,000 jobs. Um, and so um, I just really was impressed and enjoyed him. He has a TED talk. Uh, one and a half million or two million people have listened to it. Um, what I did was I, uh, what I want to show you is the first three minutes and then we did a little edit and I stuck on a little clip uh, on top of that three minutes and I could show that to you. Explains his story. Everything I do, and everything I do professionally, my life has been shaped by seven years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I'm young, but I'm not. <laughs> I worked in Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Somalia, in projects of technical cooperation with African countries. I worked for an Italian NGO. And every single project that was done in Africa failed. And I was destroyed. I thought, age 21, that we Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Instead, Everything we touched, we killed. <laughs> Our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River, and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini. <laughs> and of course, the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that, so we paid them to come and work, and sometimes they would show up. <laughs> and we were amazed that the local people in such third part of Bali could not have any agriculture. And, uh, but instead of asking them how come they were not growing anything, we simply said, thank God we're here. <laughs> Just in the nick of time to save the Zambian people from starvation. <laughs> and of course, everything in Africa grew beautifully. We had these magnificent tomatoes. In Italy, a tomato would grow to this size, in Zambia to this size. <laughs> and we could not believe it. We were telling the Zambians, look how easy agriculture is. When the tomatoes were the nice and white and red, oh nice, of 200 hippos came out of the river and they ate everything. <laughs> and we said to the Zambians, look all the hippos. And the Zambians said, yes, that's why we have more agriculture here. <laughs> why didn't you tell us? You never asked. <laughs> Blundering around Africa. But then I saw what the Americans were doing, what the English were doing, what the French were doing. And after seeing what they were doing, I became quite proud of our project in Zambia. Because you see, at least we fed the hippos. <laughs> <laughs> I 
decided when I was 27 years old to only respond to people. And I invented a system called the Christ Facilitation, where we never initiate anything, we never motivate anybody, but you become a servant of the local passion, the servant of local people who have the dream to become that person. One of the, the surprising problems is that well-intentioned, good-hearted people go out into the world to do what they want to do and know how to do and have the resources to do, even if people don't need them to do it. They go and do what they think is a good thing, but because they don't stop and ask, they do something that's either bad or a waste of time and resources. Uh, I was just thinking about this uh, uh, Lisbeth, I think I remember one of the orphanages. Um, so we were in an orphanage in um, uh, Cambodia, and um, they had buildings and they had rooms, and the rooms were almost completely bare, except in the corner they had their mats rolled up and a few items like that. And another uh, well-meaning, generous couple had been there, um, and uh, they had walked into these almost empty rooms and thought, oh my goodness, they don't have beds. And they sent them bunk beds. And the bunk beds filled up the rooms. But what they didn't know was that was not appropriate. Uh, the empty room was a place to play during the day and a place to play when it rained. And the mats, they just unrolled the mats and slept on those. That was their bed. That's all they needed. It's all they wanted. There's this over and over again, you know, the process of identifying the need is so important. Make sure it really is a need, not just because I think so. Not just because I know how to do it and want to do it, but because I can verify that it really is needed. By the way, Cirilli had a lot of stories, and um, that same valley where they, they had the hippos uh, was on the migratory path of an elephant herd. So, so if, they, if they built anything, the elephants would, would have knocked it over in their annual migration. So I think we know why that valley was given to the nonprofit. Nobody knew what to do with it. Um, he also told a story about, um, he loved telling stories about Americans making mistakes. He was Italian. And um, apparently some American Peace Corps folks were down in uh, South America or Central America. And there was an agricultural area and there was a river and there was a village. And the problem was, you know, how do the agriculturalists get their products over to the village to sell? And they said, well, that's easy. We'll just build a bridge over the river. So they built this huge ramp on each side of the river. And uh, that's as far as they got when the rainy season came. And when the rainy season was over, the river was half a mile away. It had changed its course. And that's why they never built the bridge. <laughs> but they didn't ask. So they didn't have, have local knowledge. I'm going to share a couple of stories about people who um, are good at listening. I really like this story. Bella Heeks um, met her years ago. Um, she's English. She graduated from uh, Oxford University. I think she had a degree in environmental science. And when she graduated, a friend came to her and said, um, we've got an organic vegetable box delivery service and it's kind of in trouble. Would you like to be the manager? And she said, well, I got no business experience and never studied business. I don't know. But he, he pressed her and she said, okay, I'll give it a try. Well, they increased the revenues of the company by 40 times. It was recognized as one of the 15 best places to work in the United Kingdom. Um, and she retired uh, after seven years um, to continue studying and, and doing other things. Um, what I like about her story is that she didn't have a business background, but she knew how to listen. And she was willing to listen to anybody. And I say that because she had a lot of people that didn't have her same educational background, um, but she took everybody seriously. Well, she, she had a meeting with everybody in the company, and she said, we're really struggling. We need to, to sell more organic vegetable boxes. Um, we need more customers. One of the drivers said, well, that'd be good, but why don't we first try to sell more to the customers we already have? And she said, oh, good idea. So they did that, and that worked. And she said, I think we've, I think we've done everything we can uh, with our first customers. Let's, let's try to build you know, new relationships. And the driver said, 
Great. We drive through neighborhoods all the time. We can tell you which neighborhoods we think would be worth worth the effort. And she listened and she agreed and the company continued to grow. It got to the point where they had 30 drivers doing these deliveries. And she thought, well, maybe they'd like to have a foreman, someone who would really, you know, pay attention, take care of their needs. And she had somebody in mind, but then she thought, oh, maybe I should ask them, you know, to nominate who they think would be a good foreman. And it turned out that 29 of the 30 of them nominated the same person. Because only the 30th one was the person they nominated, right? And it was a surprise to her because the person was not Caucasian, was not born in the United Kingdom, etc. But it turned out that when a new person joined the firm, this was the guy who took them around, showed them the routes, taught them the trade, the tricks, how to back in and out, how to make their deliveries. Turns out this is a guy when somebody's child was sick and they needed to stay home, he took over their routes and delivered for them. This is the guy when, you're, you know, when your son or daughter was in a school play and you wanted to get away for a couple hours, um, he took care of your deliveries. Uh, everybody knew he was the servant leader. And she appointed him. And the company continued to grow. So she just a wonderful example of someone who really was good at listening, willing to listen to anybody with a good idea. Juana Bordas uh, wrote a book called Salsa, Soul, and Spirit. Um, and she uh, spent some time with uh, members of the uh, the different uh, Native American um, tribes and nations. Um, one of the people she interviewed was John Echo Hawk, a um, member of the Pawnee Nation. And he talked about what he does during a meeting. And he calls people together and he just listens. He says, listen is what I do first. I reflect on what people are saying. I try to discern the meaning behind their words. And then I can see the common ground and the unifying themes and bring people together. So he waits and listens, and then finally uh, starts bringing people together. And then Howard B. Harm, we mentioned earlier from Starbucks, 20 years. He was president of Starbucks North America, president of uh, Starbucks International. Um, he had a sign on his wall with two words, compassionate emptiness. And he liked that sign so much, he took it home, put it in his home office when he retired. He said, I tried to listen with compassionate emptiness. Compassionate because he cared. Emptiness because he had to temporarily empty himself of his own opinions so that he was fully listening. And that's a challenge because it's so easy to be preparing your response while you're listening rather than fully listening. So that's just an example of one of the key practices, but it's the premier one listening. Comments or questions? <clears throat> Uh, Kent, I worked in inside and outside sales for more than five years for a Fortune 100 company, and I had been new after 25 years of doing other things, going into that field. And what they stressed was, if you want to be good at sales, listen. Yeah. We have signs on our computers. Listen. Listen to the customer. Find out who the customer is. Find out what the customer needs. Tell the customer what we have and how what we have might meet their needs. Mm -hmm. And boom. Right. So there are, um, again, Adam Grant, I recommend uh, this book, Give and Take. There are uh, studies that show that uh, the best salesmen spend time developing the relationship and may even come to the conclusion that what we have does not meet your needs. And yet they have a relationship. And one of the examples was uh, a salesperson who came to the conclusion that what their store had wasn't exactly what the customer was looking for and, and told them where they might find it. But the customer came back and said, I'd rather buy it from you. And bought something that, because they had the relationship. They, you know, somebody had actually listened and cared about what they were, were trying to, to, to get. Wendy, you had a, a question or comment. I could see the light. When we were driving here, we were talking about how you've been there a long time. Been married. Elizabeth doesn't want you to know how long. <laughs> We've been married. <laughs> things, I've, I've done servant leadership work for a number of years, and one of the nicest things when you go into an organization, and maybe you're going to work with them for six months or a year, is you start to get exactly that kind of feedback. Someone will say, well, I know that we're learning this for the office, but uh, I kind of took it home, and my relationship with my wife is better, or my relationship with my daughter is better, some comment of that kind. And there's research done in China um, about servant leadership, and how Chinese um, managers 
who uh, are learning servant leadership to value it will we'll bring it in the home and they actually measure the improvement of family life that resulted from servant leadership coming home. So thank you for mentioning that. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Russell. I can see an effective servant leader would be listening, developing people, um, aligning them, helping them understand, you know, their role, the mission, and where you're headed. Yeah. Okay, and the there. It, takes, it takes time. Um, and so what I've seen in, in the research is that, um, well, first of all, the time spent listening, uh, you can avoid wasting a lot of time later because um, you will avoid the big mistakes that you could have avoided if you just spent more time listening. Um, you get the buy-in, you get the understanding. Um, I worked in Japan for a couple of years and um, worked in the International Department of Securities Company. It was fun watching the Americans and the Japanese negotiate um, because the American leader, manager, whomever would come in, anxious to make a deal, ready to make the deal, ready to decide by himself. And the Japanese would take an idea and circulate it around the department and get comments. So the American would get very restless. It was taking the Japanese so long to implement, uh, excuse me, to, to, to come to a decision. But then when it came to implementation, uh, the Japanese implemented very quickly and the American couldn't implement at all because nobody back home knew what he was talking about. Uh, he hadn't consulted, he hadn't included, he got resistance, he got sabotage, he got resentment. Um, so I'm thinking there's got to be some, way to, some middle ground there where you spend enough time consulting that, that you're really bringing people on board and getting the best ideas and then people really are ready to implement. Because I, it's, it's so easy to just make a decision and then it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so that has to be part of the equation. So I think certain leaders are really good at making decisions that can be implemented. But you're absolutely right, it's up front. Um, you could save a lot of time later, but you have to make the investment up front. You're right. Lucas. Dr. Keith, uh, this might be a redundant question, but why do you think there is the main reason or reasons why managers don't listen? Sorry, main reason or reasons? Uh, why managers don't listen? Why managers don't listen? Um, you know, I think I think a lot of managers do, um, uh, especially in, in smaller companies and family companies. Um, it's just not the cultural image of a manager. The cultural, the, the secular commercial culture promotes the idea that a manager barks orders, pieces of the floor, issuing orders. You know, now, do it now, my way or the highway is decisive, you know. It's kind of dramatic leadership that um, doesn't work very well. Uh, may not work at all. But that's that's the image that people have. And one of the hard things for people who want to become a servant leader is you kind of, it's countercultural. You're kind of going against the cultural image. You're going against the image of the power model of leadership. 
Um, and so some people may think, well, you're not really leading because it's just it's such a different approach. So I think that is that is a challenge uh, for individuals is you you know you have to explain to people what you're doing and why you're doing it, and and um, it's it's a different model. Yeah. You better listen. It sounds like a lot of this is to do with like restraining your ego and like being able to put it to the side, see people listen to people and all that. So how would you suggest, what are the strategies you would think of to like restrain one's ego and restrain those other distractions so they can focus on other people? That's a really good point. So how do you, so the ego is an obstacle. I mean, it can be, right? Um, because, you know, you're saying, okay, it's not about me, it's not about power, wealth, and fame, it's not about the culturally, you know, supported symbols of success. Um, so it's not that the ego goes away, it's just that the ego, okay, by the way, I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist, so this is just my un unqualified amateur opinion. Um, the ego is satisfied by different things, um, by the opportunity to live an authentic life, by the opportunity to live your values, by the opportunity to find the meaning that comes with loving and helping other people. So you, it's not about power, wealth, and pain, but it is. You, I mean, it's not selfless, it's not like you get nothing at all. But what you get is not what the secular commercial society is offering. So if, if you if you um, get the meaning and the satisfaction that comes from living and leading that way, your ego is getting something. It's just not how it wants to be. So I think it's like redirecting the ego rather than pretending you don't have one. So I appreciate the question. That's a really good, really good point. Yeah. I appreciate all your comments and your insights. I was trying to relate it to teaching and uh, mentorship. I keep on thinking about compassionate mentorship, more like what your, your discussion here. Let, let me describe the concept of Laosher in, in Chinese society, senpai, sensei. Uh, the idea is it's, it's deeper than just being a teacher and a student. Mm -hmm. Much deeper. There's a whole multi levels. And it requires both respect and honoring and empty, empty, like what you had mentioned, compassion and empty. All of this is required on both sides in many ways. And I'm trying to relate that to both this idea about mentorship and also leadership. And I'm still trying to grapple with mm -hmm. it in my head. So good leaders try to be mentors. There is, there is a connection. Well, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm trying to, to be conscious of our time. Um, so here's a little summary. Servant leadership works so well because servant leaders identify and meet the needs of others. They identify and meet the needs of their colleagues so they can perform at their highest levels. They identify and meet the needs of their customers so that we truly serve. So that's the one thing I'd like you to remember, that phrase, identify and meet the needs of others. I think that's the key. It works so well because the service model of leadership works, not the power model. Because of theory Y assumptions, not theory X. By getting beyond extrinsic motivation, emphasize intrinsic motivation, focus on meaning at work and being a meaning maker for others, and effective key practices like this. So, thank you very much.